of you are, are serial entrepreneurs. I think for both of you, Castlight and Fitbit are your third companies. Um, you've got a wealth of experience here to share um, with the audience, particularly to the entrepreneurs out there. And um, you know, building a company is, is hard work. You know, what brings you back to do this, not just a second time, but a, a third time? What keeps you motivated and fired up? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting us here. It's, it's an honor to be with all of you. Two myths. One, serial entrepreneur, all that means is unemployable. So it's not that much more than anything else. The second thing is, the second myth, and this is really, I'm serious about this. There's a little bit about, well, the serial entrepreneur, you work so hard. Guys, everybody works hard. You know, my nanny works incredibly hard. People in, uh, in, in a restaurant work hard. We all work hard. We just do what we love to do or what we know how to do. I mean, that's, I was a doctor before this, and as my father said when he saw my first company, he said, you probably didn't do that well in med school, right? <laughs> and uh, all I could do is really, when I have an idea, try to start something and build it, and I have fun doing it. Like other people have fun doing other things, and they all work very hard. So I don't see any difference in that. Just do what you love and keep doing it. That's great. Well, the topic today is about scaling your company. So I know both of you have faced many challenges in building and scaling your, your companies. And I'm wondering if you could share, each share a story with us um, about one of the challenges that maybe you encountered that had an unexpected outcome and what you learned uh, from that. Should I go first? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. I mean, I have many unexpected bad outcomes. I'm, I'm assuming you imagine an unexpected bad outcome and yeah. not an unexpected good well, outcome. It could be either. And because it's also easier because the unexpected bad ones are much more frequent. I would say the biggest unexpected outcome that any entrepreneur should expect is uh, hiring the wrong person. That's something that happens. And unfortunately, in my case, I can go back. You know, I, I looked a lot of what I did when I, when I hired the wrong people. <laughs> The biggest learning curve for me was to learn how to hire people that are very different than me. So I went to you know, med school, and then I did my MBA. I have a certain background, and this and that. And I would always look at people that had the same intellectual, analytical bent. Well, guess what? Different roles have different type of people. So to make a long story short, Learn how to hire people that are different than you. Make sure you have a counterbalance and somebody else helping you on that. And the worst outcome is you have somebody that is not working out, just cut it right away. Just make sure it's better for everybody. The, the joke I always say, it's not a joke, the analogy I tell my team is we try to hire Michael Jordan all the time, but sometimes we give him a basketball court. And if you remember Michael Jordan, a uh, baseball court. Uh, sometimes Michael Jordan, you know, Michael Jordan wasn't that great at baseball. So let's help him find a basketball court out of here, and that will be the best for him or her. James? Um, I think one negative surprise was uh, due to our own optimism. So uh, when we first announced Fitbit in September 2008, we told people that we would start shipping the product at Christmas. And we did, except it was Christmas of the following year. So <laughs> we were... Um, we're a year late, and uh, we, we've learned a lot from that. Uh, mainly how to keep an uh, uh, angry list of pre-order customers happy over 12 months. Um, the second is, uh, you know, as we entered the retail channel with our products, um, products did really well, and at times we had trouble keeping our retailers in stock. And, you know, someone who isn't experienced with the channel would think, hey, that's, that's a great problem to have. You know, the product's really hot, it's selling out. But, you know, retailers get extremely disappointed with your inability to supply them because they've dedicated the shelf space to you. It's sitting empty, and they're not making any money. So over the long term, what you think is successful can actually damage trade relations. So, I really hope you keep being an optimist because your product is awesome. Thanks. So <laughs> I'm a lover of your product. So. That's great. By the way, I found my Fitbit that I great. lost on Sunday. You guys should all try Fitbit. It's fantastic. Um, I want to build a little bit on the subject of team. And uh, Gio, when you and I spoke earlier this week, um, you were, uh, surprising me, very humble about your role at Castlight and very celebratory of the team that you've assembled and that makes uh, Castlight what it is today. And um, you touched a little bit about the importance of making a good hire how do you make those good hires into an effective team? So first of all, nobody has ever accused me of being humble. So that's, <laughs> I actually got, I, I, 
that's not, that's not fair. I'm not <laughs> humble. The reality is this. Uh, this is how I look at things, you know, and this is, everybody has a different way of doing it. I don't pretend by any means to have the right way. Building a team and building a group of people that work together is a very deep spiritual experience. You'll hear this a lot in our company. I want to build a team with people I love and that love working with me. So the question I ask everybody, even in my teammates, is just be kind to each other. Do something kind. I always, we start frequently team meetings. My, my, like my, my management team, I always start like two things. Tell me what was the best thing that happened to you last week and have you done something kind to somebody today? When you create that kind of culture around you, you attract a certain type of people that want to work with you because what you're trying to do goes beyond just building a business. And that's the kind of family and group that we want to create at Castlight. And we've turned out great people, great people, wonderful people, just didn't fit the spiritual experience we were trying to create in our company. And I think we have a pretty good team at this point, and we really do, we really do love working with each other. Doesn't mean we don't get upset, doesn't mean we don't have our issues. Two rules we've established, and then I'll stop here. One is nobody can raise their voice. It's just a rule. We don't raise our voice, and nobody can curse. At the beginning of the company, anybody who cursed had to put a dollar, and we would go and buy. So I, I don't drink, but we would buy, you know, in my case, green tea and everybody else beer with that dollar left. Now we don't even do it anymore because they know the rules, and we don't get the dollar. So we're broke by the end of the month. And um, James, I'd love for you to build on Gio's thoughts. What does a great team look like? To you, and what do you expect of your team? Um, I guess I get a little bit, you know, tact, you know, answer that question more tactically. So um, we have a great team at Fitbit, and, the, and one of the things I appreciate the most is that each member of the executive team is able to see the the bigger picture beyond their department function. So one very practical example is, um, you know, setting credit limits for retailers, and you have the head of finance and the head of sales in the room trying to determine you know, how much credit should we give this retailer who we, th you know, who we think is somewhat challenged? And if, if each took their own parochial view of the situation, um, you know, the finance person would say, let's extend them zero credit. And the sales guy would say, well, I don't care about their credit. Let's just ship them everything we've got. Um, so I think, you know, it's great to have a team that's able to see the bigger picture and set the balance and make the right business decisions. And what do you do to help them have that bigger picture? What kind of culture have you created in terms of maybe transparency? Um, you know, I think, I don't know if we've done anything specific, but, you know, it's, it's all been through the hiring process where we have specifically look for people who, um, you know, our team players are able to be cooperative, um, and a lot of that comes out through reference checks, et cetera. So, um, Gio, for you, you know, healthcare presents considerable challenges. It's not an easy space uh, really? to, to, oh, <laughs> to work in. Thanks. <laughs> People I didn't say, realize you know, it. wow, you really want to, you know, keep working in this space. Aren't you jaded or cynical yet? How do you, you know, building on this idea of team, inspire people to create something new and something awesome, particularly in, in a market that, you know, can be a bit frustrating. Well, so first of all, I, on this I actually beg to disagree. I think healthcare is a fascinating market, and it's the only area where you wake up every day and you feel you're doing something for millions of people. Now, we're not solving the problem of cancer, but we're helping people buy better care and understand the quality of care. That, that motivates people a lot. To answer your question, again, this is how I've driven my life all the way, all the way through. I believe starting a company always takes an act of courage to begin with because you're, you're going against, you know, basically you know you're gonna live without salary for a long time. And it also, it's, it's just not the, what everybody else does, you know. It's, but the second thing, it's all about the dream. It really is help people understand that you're building something bigger than what you could do by yourself. There's plenty of studies that show that people die for the guy next to them in war, not because they're going to be making money together, not because they're going to be building or they're going to be famous, but because they're sharing a dream, they're sharing something that means much more to them, that they're just individual contribution. I'll stop here. You know, you, have, you, you read history. You see, what are the biggest things that has happened? That have happened? Churchill in 1940 didn't go out there and said, oh, okay, the, the Germans are bombing us. If we can bomb them back, you know, we're going to all get rich and make uh, the, the British Empire 
dominate Europe. No, he just said, we will resist. We will win. We are the last, last savior of civility. Otherwise, Hitler is going to take over Europe. And thousands of people, when nobody thought this could be done, signed up for that dream. And the rest is history. Um, switching gears a little, I expect that some of the entrepreneurs here in the audience today have maybe been told by some investors that, you know, they've got a cool gadget, maybe some interesting tech, the product or service is a bit of an, a novelty. Um, James, question for you. How do entrepreneurs ensure that what they're building can actually become a company? Um, <clears throat> sometimes, even if you think it can become a company, I mean, people won't believe you anyway. So, I mean, when we... Uh, first started Fitbit, um, you know, we had a lot of difficulty raising money for our seed round, our Series A, our Series B, I could go on. Um, you know, over the course of, of many years, we've probably talked to at least 60 VCs who've turned us down. Um, I don't know if it had anything to do with whether they thought it was a feature or whether, you know, they thought it could be an actual company. Um, I think the biggest challenge we faced uh, with investors was mainly that um, they couldn't imagine themselves using the product and how it would benefit them. Um, so for me personally, at the very beginning, it was very difficult for, you know, I'm not a natural salesperson, so very difficult for me to convince them that this is a product that millions of other people, other than you, would use and enjoy and love. Um, I think I've gotten better at that, but, you know, I think uh, the very... Um, you know, lack of diversity in the venture community um, is one of the detriments, I think, in healthcare investing. He just insulted all the investors in here. I don't uh, know. Lack of diversity means herd mentality, too, but... He's not raising but money But thank right you for now. saying it, so you get yeah, me off the hook money, on this so one. Yes. So, <laughs> Gia, when, in, in targeting employers, did, did you find that? Was it hard to convince them of a, a need? Was there well, we, we were very lucky. Our first customer was Safely, which is a very visionary employer with a great CEO. And we didn't have to convince them about the dream of what we wanted to do. Uh, Steve Byrne, in that case, bought in right away what the vision was. He's a very, very strong, detailed guy, so we had to convince them we could execute against that dream. That was the, the, that was the tough part. But we were very lucky because our fr we have been lucky all the way through. Our first customer was a great partner. They treated us very well. They helped us build what we did. I mean, I want to recognize that. I think there's actually somebody from Safeway in the room. They, they are an outstanding company, very visionary. And, and the other thing is we were lucky because they really shared the passion for what we were doing. It wasn't just, we're going to partner with you because you're a vendor. And they are passionate about delivering good services to their members. And that's the best thing, you know, because then you have fun. And we did a lot of things wrong, and they always kept us honest moving forward. So I would say, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but, you know, we had also some good salespeople as we grow. Now we have good salespeople that are out there. Yeah, great advice about picking your first partner as well. Um, I expect that both of you are asked often to counsel entrepreneurs. You probably have a lot of people who are seeking mentorship. Um, one of the, the challenges that I hear a lot in the companies I work with is monetization. And I'm curious how, when you're talking to entrepreneurs who may be a bit uh, challenged with that, uh, what, what you tell them. Because healthcare, unlike a lot of other industries, sometimes the question is, who will pay? Uh, for us, I guess, um I don't know if you really thought about monetization in the very beginning. For us, it was a very simple thing. Because we were building a physical device, uh, the business model was very simple. Um, we'd manufacture at some cost and then sell the device at higher than that cost, hopefully. Um, and, but you know, reflecting back, it's interesting to see that, at least for consumers, a lot of the money today is generated by delivery of either a physical, you know, tangible good or a service, um, you know, Weight Watchers does great with their meetings. Um, you know, there's a lot of devices sold by, uh, at the high end, by Garmin, Polar, et cetera, uh, more everyday devices like Fitbit, et cetera. Um, you know, meal delivery services like Nutrisystem. Um, you know, what's interesting to see is that, you know, how do you monetize just pure apps, uh, mobile apps? I don't know if I have the answer. Um, I'm just kind of glad we don't have to struggle with that question. So I'm kind of copying out of that. Beyond that. that. <laughs> um, it's interesting. There are a lot, it, 
healthcare is attracting a lot of innovators from different fields, which is fantastic. You talked about being inspired by the Nintendo Wii, right? Um, you know, a lot of folks from tech and media are entering the, the healthcare space today, um, which can present some challenges along with the opportunities. What advice do you both have for people from outside of traditional healthcare coming into the space, needing to partner and, and get traction? Uh, I think it all has to do with your passion and interest. Um, so for instance, I started a hardware company, but I knew nothing about hardware at the time. You know, I'd probably taken one digital circuit design class in college, and that was many, many years ago. Um, but I dove right in, you know, was heavily involved in the design of uh, the hardware from component selection, et cetera. I spent countless hours, nights, pouring over data sheets. Um, you know, as we entered uh, the realm of corporate wellness, um, really try to understand who the major players were, their motivations, et cetera. Um, and so all of this was just driven by personal, deep personal interest. And, you know, that's reflected by the amount of time that you can spend researching and exploring a problem. Well, I've, first of all, I'm a recovering physician, so that pretty much puts me in the healthcare space to begin with. There's not that much else I know. Two things. One is, I don't think it's there's any challenge in the fact that many people, this is a 1.8, 1.7, depending on looking at trillion dollar industry. So welcome. I mean, more entrepreneurs come in, the better it is. It's, it's fascinating to see how finally, I mean, people like me who have been at it for 30 years, 35 started when I was five years old. So 30, 35 <laughs> years, uh, uh, we have scars on our back. And to see such great people, some wonderful entrepreneurs that have a dream and pursue it in healthcare, that is phenomenal. I, I'm so excited to see this happening now. The second thing is finally we see changes happening. I mean, it's the perfect storm now, right? There's a convergence. I, you know, we, I didn't answer the question on the business model, so at this point it's past that, but I could tell you, it's just, it's really important now you finally see a lot of things converging between technology, cost control, uh, employers being empowered and deciding what you know what to do. It's the right moment to be an entrepreneur in healthcare, and it's it's great. And you know, people will fail. We'll do it again. I, I tell entrepreneurs my best thing is make sure that you have the right attitude and you double your failure rate because at one point you will succeed. And it's it's just even when you quote unquote fail, it's so much worth it that you have nothing better. Nothing. If I look back professionally, there's nothing better than when I started a company. I actually enjoy much more, I mean, I took a company public, so we've been in the big company too. I enjoy so much more this stage, it's so cool. I mean, every day you go to work, you, you're there building things. When it starts getting routine, it's not that much fun anymore, for me. I mean, that's probably because I'm not good at it. Well, I'm not good at that much of either stages, but the big one, I'm really bad at it. So that's when I, you don't like it, right, when you're not good at something. So. Um, I agree. This is a, a perfect storm right now in terms of innovation in healthcare. But I'd like to ask you both if you could see one change that would happen over the next year that would really help to further accelerate digital health uh, innovation. What would you like to see? Uh, again, very tactical because um, it's a problem that we have today. But um, I think just the inability for handset makers to really make uh, low power wireless technologies like Bluetooth low energy work uh, well, um, I think is a real detriment to this category that we're in, um, where you think of you know a, a sensor device and a smartphone working in conjunction with each other to, de to deliver a compelling experience. Um, right now, Apple is really the only company that's um, enabled the sensor market, and Android is, is really, really far behind. So I'm um, looking forward to the Android team at Google developing a really robust uh, Bluetooth low energy stack. Anyone here from uh, Google? <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody from Google everywhere these days. So, <laughs> uh, And I say that with a lot of respect, uh, by any means. It's one, one of the best companies in the world. I'm not joking. Uh, the uh, the uh, biggest change is actually close to happen. And it is, keep your fingers crossed, it's happening faster than what I thought. And that's the release to the of the Medicare data, not just to what they call qualified entities, but to all of us. We're working very closely now with the Senate. We're working very close with Medicare. It is going to happen. It is a gold mine of information. I mean, that is literally going to change the way we all, all of us, I mean, we have millions of claims now. We have a bunch of 
you know, PhDs in math and, and, and statistics working in our company, when we get that data, it's going to be awesome for all of us, for all of you. It's going to change the way we really approach. And we're getting, you know, keep our fingers crossed. We're very, getting very, very close. I was kindly invited to testify at the Senate about a month ago. And after that, I spent a lot of time with Rockefeller, who runs the healthcare group there. And he is all over this. The qualified entity definition for the release of Medicare data, I don't want to bore you why, but that's a, that's a travesty. Right? That's just doctors, with all due respect for my colleagues, that are saying we don't want to be judged, and so we're going to control this data. And that it's just, it's just that's ending now. So uh, everybody will be a qualified entity as long as you meet the requirements, and the requirements are going to be very reasonable. That's going to change healthcare. That's really going to give us a set of data that nobody in the world has. It's phenomenal. I agree. Let me, do we have time for one more? Raquel? Do we have that's okay. Nope, we're cutting off. It's 4.30. Hallie's cutting us off. All right. Thank you both very much for sharing your wisdom with us. <laughs>